Okay, welcome. Hope everybody had a good lunch. I know I did. A little bit of liquid bread with lunch. So um, <clears throat> I think people keep coming in, maybe, um, with it being after lunch. Uh, but uh, my name's Matt Porter. I'm with Consulco Group. Um, we're a small embedded Linux consulting software development company. Um, been here a lot of times at ELC Europe, and I'm going to talk today about uh, uh, Linux software update technologies. Um, try not to inject opinion in by any manner, spoken or body language, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so uh, thanks for coming, and uh, we'll get started here. Maybe. All right, so we're going to do a little overview. We're going to do a little background. I usually like to talk a little history about where we came from um, and doing software update, right? We've been doing this as a community since 1991 in some form. And um, then we'll talk about um, today's um, set of strategies that are used to update Linux systems. Um, and then we'll, we'll look, do a detailed look at each uh, free or open source project. Uh, I don't cover things that uh, may be proprietary. Um, those don't really matter. Uh, and uh, criteria are, you know, what strategy they're employing technically, um, any other features they might provide uh, in these projects, maturity, try to get a little gauge of what kind of communities around these uh, technologies, and then, uh, you know, what kind of uptake they have, right? What, what kind of downstream projects are using uh, these technologies. All right, so with that, um, when we look back at, at history of day one, um, if anybody was here in 91, 92, um, you might have started with HJ Lu's boot root floppies, right? Um, so you had, of course, five and a quarter floppies, and you'd put one in, it would boot up and get to root, and you'd put the second one in and root off that floppy, and then you were on your own to build everything else up from there, right? And so that was state of the art. Um, and then we got to um, kind of the, the forerunners of the modern distributions with MCC, TAMU, SLS, okay? And if you came in the Slackware generation, you, you missed the fun here. Uh, so packages and tarballs, that might see f seem familiar from later things. Um, but there was no dependencies. So the packages were just tarballs of logically um, package things with, with either static or shared libraries and just no, no notion of dependencies um, between these packages. Um, Slackware um, came about and uh, partially because SLS wasn't very well maintained. And uh, again, packages were in tarballs. There weren't any dependencies, but you could upgrade from release to release with this carefully scripted uh, dance Right, so be a bit flaky if you were out of date, right, and tried to go too far ahead. So as we get into the modern world, right, which was starting in that 93-ish time frame, um, then we had the Debian's, the Red Hat Linux, who's uh, derivatives, right? We're just not trying to leave anybody out, but those are the, the major players, right? And uh, that's what brought in our, our modern DEB or RPM packaging that we still deal with today on most of our desktop systems, our workstations, right? And uh, so the biggest, the biggest thing that was added was the set of dependencies, right, that, that were um, tracked as part of that package format and so forth, and the ability to do updates and pull in these other packages and know what versions you depend on, right? Um, what was key with those, though, is that when we do update those, uh, the updates are, aren't atomic, right? So you're updating one package at a time on the system. Uh, ordering can matter, right? And um, when you do a update to a whole new release, so if I've got um, distribution uh, foo and it has a set of uh, package versions, right? Um, you could do a release update by designating a set 
uh, of those packages at some version and just go through non-atomically and update them all. So I'm not telling you anything new, right? A little history. It's the same thing we probably do on most of our distributions now when we, we roll up to the next release, right? And um, the real key is um, when you are updating those, right, in that non-atomic uh, uh, sense, um, that's all driven by this complex set of pre and post install scripts, right? And it's a little bit more complicated than that. Some of you probably realize that from packaging things up. Um, but uh, that's kind of the, the, uh, the general overview of those things. So let's talk about anytime you're looking at Linux software update, you got to think about requirements, right? And there's many requirements, right? That's the first thing you have to keep in mind is that there is no one proper software update strategy, right? Depends on your requirements, right? Every product's different. Um, you've got different different things pulling you, both technically, hardware constraints, um, and whatever your product is, right? What are the, the features of it, right? So you're not gonna get any exact steps today. You're gonna get guidelines only. So the things you think about when you're thinking of big, broad categories, right? Uh, well, do I need this to be power fail safe, right? Obviously, when you're a desktop person, you're not worried about the power going out, right? Well. You may, you're probably on a UPS like me, uh, but if you're on an embedded system like we're really here to talk about, right, you're worrying about power failing. In some cases, maybe others, you don't worry about that so much, right? Are you doing frequent updates? I mean, do you have hot patches coming every day, right, and you're, you're dealing with CVEs in an aggressive manner, right? Um, or are they infrequent, right? Are you doing once a month, once a year because you don't care about security like most of the consumer electronics companies. So um, the other thing is, uh, as you're uh, getting more advanced in uh, software update, now you're thinking about, well, I've got some delivery channel and I've got a whole fleet of devices, right? And I'm paying for that delivery channel, right? OTA updates. And so now the size of this update comes into play because when you magnify that and you're paying for that airtime to reach all those devices. So any of these fleet devices from the broad term of IoT to automotive rollouts, right? They're concerned about um, the size of the update, right? So you may need to keep it small in other cases, it may be something where um, you're inserting a physical device, right, and the update's done there, and maybe the size doesn't matter in that case. Um, another area is, um, is speed of update, right? Depending on the scheme you take, right, how much downtime. If your update strategy requires some downtime, right, you need to be worried about you know, how long is that downtime, right? Or is it something I can do in the background and quickly recycle, right? Or can I do a partial update without having any downtime? So these are all considerations you're doing um, along the way. And, uh, you know, also in there is, you know, verification authentication, right? And my crypto hashing things um, is, is what's coming through that channel, what, you know, my service is provided and not, you know, some rogue payload. So, um, so we'll start with kind of the first class, and I go through these broad classes of update technologies because they all they fit into a, a pretty simple group. So we have the traditional method, right? Um, I already touched on the non-atomic, um, package-based, right? Represented usually by on the back end by uh, dev packages, RPM packages, right? And um, so we've got that package-based granularity. Right? We've got dependency hierarchy that usually explodes out, right? All those shared libraries you need and as you pull something in and, and uh, uh, typically driven uh, in the desktop systems by, you know, APT or YUM uh, on the front end. Um, but uh, one of the things we find in uh, embedded devices is that that approach is unacceptable, okay? Um, and uh, uh, one of the reasons, right, is we've already touched on, 
uh, is that um, with that non-atomic update, right, the reliability is not there. Has anybody updated their desktop system and had anything left in an unstable, unworking state on an update? Yeah, me many times, right? And that's because you have arbitrary states that it's at in a non-atomic update um, scenario. So sometimes, you know, you have to you have to uh, rely on luck for those things to work. All right, so um, the next big class uh, is the traditional full image update. And um, this is the way that a lot of systems, or most systems, whether they've been embedded Linux systems or other embedded systems, have been updated from the beginning of time. Um, and uh, so if we look at a, a typical one in an embedded Linux system that would be a, a dual update uh, style, right? Um, you would boot your active image, you come into the system, and as I say, a completely unrealistic and simplified version, um, but good enough for that 30,000 foot view. Uh, you boot an active image, right? And um, you're gonna receive and install an update and that's gonna go to the secondary partition that's like your inactive partition, okay? Um, once that's all been installed, authenticated, verified, all those details that go on in the background, right? Um, while obviously your, your first image is what's running, um, you would communicate with the bootloader um, or whatever mechanism you use for, for bootloading, if it's a separate entity like a U-boot, um, typically in an embedded Linux system, and uh, uh, typically want to uh, atomically toggle that B partition active and A inactive and reboot, right? And so when you boot up, you boot into the new active image B, right? Image A becomes inactive, and um, typically you'll have some fallback mechanism um, whether it's a, a watchdog or a heartbeat um, that will test for booting, there's some features in U-boot. Um, it's kind of implementation details. Uh, but that's the general uh, approach there. Um, so then we get into the, the new kid on the block. Um, a lot of people look at this and they say, oh my gosh, you know, this, is, this is not uh, keep it simple stupid type approach. And that's this incremental atomic updates. And uh, so where we first saw this coming into play was really uh, like a lot of technology we leverage in the embedded side is on the server side of the house. And um, they've had uh, needs to um, have incremental atomic upgrades that they can roll out very quickly, um, very small uh, updates to address CVEs on their uh, um, expose the internet servers, right? Maintain their uptime, also be able to roll those back, right? Very quickly. Um, and part of that is having that complete history of deployments as well. So um, the way it works is you have your actual release of your root file system is uh, composed of a, a set of binary deltas. So rather than working on a, a package granularity, they're working on a per file granularity and a logical set of deltas, uh, binary deltas on that. And uh, one of the benefits of this is that the size of updates are minimized. So if you look at um, our package-based granularity and you need to update a very large package, right, just to change this one delta in a file, right, um, in this case, if, if that was, you know, a three megabyte you know, package, you, you might only have a, a 7K delta, right, to go modify that in a binary delta um, incremental update scheme. So there's some advantages there that are nice that trade it off for the uh, additional complexity. Um, and then one more thing, I actually was thinking today uh, that uh, I passed over this and it's worth worth adding in, so you won't see them in the, this in the slides that are already published, but um, uh, containers, um, for the same reason from the server side, right, that, that 
they've moved a lot of application work to uh, all into com containers so that those can be upgraded independently of the base OS. Um, this is another strategy. It can also be used in a hybrid way. So um, typically you build on top of a, a core immutable uh, base OS, right? And it could be any distribution, a, a minor distribution. I mean, that's the whole point of core OS, right? And uh, then you roll your updates out in container deltas. Now, one of the things here is that there's no, there's no discussion of, well, how do I update my base OS when there's some flaw in that, right? Um, it's just treated that that's immutable forever. Not always realistic, um, but if most of your focus is on the, uh, the application side and being seamlessly able to update those, um, that's a strategy, and it's often combined. So these things can, can be combined in a number of different uh, hybrid approaches. So getting into, you know, we're hitting that part where we're, we're going to get into some actual projects that, that do um, that, that implement uh, software update mechanisms um, that you can go uh, grab and play with. Um, so the, the first, and I kind of go in order of that group of uh, technologies. So um, software update, uh, a very um, generic name, uh, but uh, uh, so it's, it's a singular dual image framework. So it can work in, in either approach. Um, you can find it here on GitHub. Um, it's a developer at Dank Software Engineering uh, maintains this. Um, it's written in C. Um, very easy to follow code. It's GPL2 license. Um, and uh, he's got he's going to attempt to be modular uh, with plugins is one of the things he has uh, has a notion of handlers that you can plug in for different image types. Um, one of the things that within those handlers um, you'll find support for uh, signed images, um, also uh, local and remote updates from a, a couple different schemes. Uh, there's a, there's a built-in web server um, and. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, an, another um, RESTful API uh, support. We'll get into that next. Um, he also has um, a very tight coupling with U-Boot um, in that. And, uh, and then he maintains a, a meta software update layer to make it easy to generate images that are compliant and include both the, the client and compliant with uh, the needs of the client. Um, as far as community, uh, it, it's actually in the past, when I first looked at it, it didn't have a whole lot of contributors, but, and that was like a year ago. Um, there's uh, quite a few different contributors outside the, the author now. A lot of, there's a few outstanding pull requests and so forth. So it's not a solo project anymore. Um, seems to have a, a reasonable amount of uh, take up for, for people to have uh, the requirements it meets. Um, and then, uh, you know, downstream, um, uh, it's used at least by, by Siemens. You know, a lot of these things, it's hard to see what downstream projects are using <laughs> different technologies if, if it's in a, a closed product. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a session uh, later, um, in fact, talking about using a software update um, in Siemens projects. Um, so the way that software update manages these um, uh, it, it defines a specific image type, and you can see it's a very simple CPIO archive. Um, it has a um, description header on that, and then it's just a series of sub-images, as I'll call them. Um, so each of those images is described in that software description header, okay? And um, then it's, uh, it's validated with SHA-256. The... Uh, as I mentioned on the first slide on this, right, the handler plugins implement all the details of how each of these image types are handled. So when, when one of them's identified, it'll invoke a handler for U-Boot. So if you're updating the U-Boot image, right, then um, um, it, will go the, it will do the ENV update, okay? It knows UBI uh, partitions, uh, uh, also NOR NAND without without UBI there, and then the MMC style updating. Uh, and then, you know, the notion is 
because that's extensible, you know, say you've got an FPGA and you need to update the bitstream in your spy flash, right? You can write a custom handler, carry that image um, in one of the in, in this overall update image and have a custom handler go install that uh, uh, FPGA bitstream by writing to that spy flash, right? assuming it's in a non-volatile flash. So the, the software description field, um, you can also extend it. Um, he has a, a Lua pro, um, parser, parser in it, and so you can support any kind of arbitrary description in there and uh, just write uh, some Lua code to, uh, to actually parse that out. Um, <clears throat> right now, um, so one of the things that you can do is you could go um, use a, a different parser and define a whole bunch of different hardware platforms in one engine or in one image and uh, use your custom parser to you know sort through those revisions or family of platforms and so forth um, when you actually configure this uh, configuration file um, can be driven with with uh, libconfig style syntax or uh, an xml um, and uh, so you, you can choose either. Um, the XML is obviously easier for you know, some outside tool parsing um, for some people. Um, it uses kbuild for configuration, so pretty com familiar, um, kind of kernel, kernel uh, developer centric. Uh, so that, that should be very familiar to a lot of people. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, it's got a built-in uh, web server um, that's, that's based on Mongoose. And then uh, one of the other things that's been extended recently, and I believe it's the gentleman from Siemens using in this project that was involved with this, is there's a, a RESTful API that he uses with the Hawkbit server for remote update. So it's reasonably flexible to fit into different delivery mechanisms and so forth. It tries to focus on just that piece of doing the update and the ugliness of, of managing that. Um, there's a couple strange things I saw in it, like there's a kind of dangling user space GPIO library. Um, and there, there's some other ones out there. And I know he, he mentioned syncing up with uh, using a GPIO to signal that uh, uh, an update completed. I don't know if that's intended for that, but um, there may be a little bit of dead code in the project that needs to be cleaned up because it didn't seem to be used by anything. So just a little tidbit of what I saw in there. Um, so moving on to the next one, um, Mender I.O., if you're here and you haven't heard of them, I don't know how because they got a big booth and there's a bunch of talks on the, <laughs> on the uh, agenda. So, uh, so Mender, um, very interesting piece of software. It's uh, fundamentally a, a dual image. Let me back up a second and, and say that on software update, you can actually implement a single image approach where you update in place uh, or a dual image. It's configurable for either. Most people will go with a dual image if they have the space because of requirement necessity. Okay, so back to Mender. Um, so it's a, it's a dual image approach. You can find um, the project there um, that they, the, the, the team at Mender maintains on GitHub. Um, it's designed as a client server system fundamentally. Um, as opposed to software update, it's just the client on, on the system and it deals with a web server. Um, Mender has both a, a client and a separate server. Um, it's written in Go. Um, that's an uh, important distinction I'm trying to, to show on each of these is where possible um, is that, you know, uh, language can matter, you know, having to maintain um, you know, Go or Rust or any of that um, less mature systems um, in a project might, might preclude it from being used in your system. Um, but uh, might also be an advantage. So um, it's Apache 2 license. Um, they maintain a MetaMender uh, la uh, layer that um, what's, what's interesting with that is that builds a client into the, the device, of course, um, similar to what software update uh, maintains as well. Uh, you can find it there. Um, and they also have some reference platforms that they maintain as well, so you can start off and, and try it out very easily. Um, 
when you look at, at GitHub and you look at the contributors, um, like a lot of um, new projects, the, the project contributors right now are overwhelmingly uh, mentor employees. Um, you judge that however you will. Uh, just trying to reflect how big the community is and so forth at this point. So there's, there's two models with the way that Mender works. Um, you can run it in standalone mo uh, model, and um, you trigger the updates locally. So that's pull request, okay? And um, then if you run it in manage mode, it runs as a daemon, okay? And it'll pull the server for updates when the server's ready to deliver, right? So that would be more the, con the continuous delivery type model of updates on the, the back end. Okay, um, Mender's, their, their dual image setup, they, co they call it in their documentation AB, there's many names, right? Um, uh, so they use a notion of a commit when an update has booted. So when the, the update's uh, actually been successful, right, that's considered a committed, right? And uh, on failure, it'll toggle that inactive, inactive partition uh, back um, the same way we discussed in the, the overview of how a dual image update occurs. So they do a very classic dual image approach, tried and true. It's kind of the same stuff that's been been used on you know commercial embedded Linux systems since early 2000, right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, the other, the other interesting thing is um, they, they do follow um, uh, U-boot uh, de facto standards and use the features built in there. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, they have uh, reference platforms, as I mentioned, um, on QMU. Um, so you don't even need hardware. Wonderful, right? Um, but if you do, um, BeagleBone Black is a reference platform. So you can go get it and you can try it out, see how their system works. Right, and that makes it easy for getting started. Um, so um, one of the differences we see, you know, in, in everybody's project scope is, is different. So software update, it's being used in some project, but he doesn't try to be a complete end-to-end -end solution like Mender is doing, right? The whole delivery end and so forth. And here, in doing a complete demonstrable solution, they've made some assumptions, right? So um, you need to have um, a U-boot, a, re a reasonably recent U-boot, and a lot of commercial vendor code trees don't have a recent U-boot. Um, you need one um, with a boot count limit. Um, they assume that you can read extended 234 file system, um, that you have environment, U-boot uh, environment tools in your Linux root file system and uh, obviously a specific U-boot configuration to make this all work. So they're depending on some things, but they're also giving you a whole turnkey framework, right, on that end. Um, and if you're running in managed mode, you, it's built exclusively around system D. Uh, again, it's, it's an assumption. Some people choose not to, to use that, but you might have to do a little work to get that assumption out of the way if you don't want to use system D. Um, obviously, there's a set of kernel options required for that as well. Um, and, um, and then the layout partitioning, the, the other assumption, there's a, there's, a very, there's a very fixed assumption of how the partitions are laid out, right? So you have, um, you have the U-boot in one partition, you've got a persistent data partition, and then just two AB partitions that have both the root FS and kernel. So if you're managing something different, you're going to have to do a bit more work uh, on top of what the, the reference platform um, implements. Uh, right now, um, it's specifically designed uh, around and, and supporting uh, uh, the MMC style, block IO uh, style um, file systems. And uh, so it doesn't have any explicit uh, support for NOR, NAND, UBI. Uh, that's not something that couldn't be added, um, but not there right now. Um, it's got great documentation when you go through of how to actually um, bring up a new platform and, and, you know, port the client to it and what all is needed. So um, all those, there's a lot more details about all of the requirements on the U-boot side and the partitions and so forth. So really 
well done docs. Um, like I said, there's, there's a turnkey platforms um, that you can try out. And then they actually have a CI loop running for this um, with their code base. Um, so that's good. And then the, the test and QA tools that go with that are all out there. So, uh, so pretty well run project. Um, seems to have everything to kind of move forward. OK. Um, now we're getting into that crazy stuff, right? Um, so crazy stuff starts with OS tree. Um, and OS tree is one of those incremental atomic update mechanisms. And you can find a um, page there, and then there's a documentation page off of there that really describes a lot. Um, one of the quotes I like, you know, is that self-described. <laughs> self-described is Git for operating system binaries. And that, it really is the easiest way to look through it. And if you go and you work through some of the examples and play with it on your own systems, you'll, you'll see what they mean by that, OK? Because the file system itself is stored in a Git-like object store, right? And um, as we said in the overview of these things, it's using binary deltas now. Right, to track the changes between these objects. Okay. And um, these, these depend on an immutable, immutable file, file system hierarchy. So it has, I can't even say that phrase today. Um, so this, this file system hierarchy um, is, is based on the user merge style uh, of um, root file system. And so everything that's persistent will be in Etsy is the requirement. So as you're getting into these more advanced or frameworks that actually work, they start making assumptions and forcing those assumptions on you. So if you, you think you can do it the old way, to get some of these advantages, you, in order to get there, you need to change your root file system. So there's a lot of distros out there and embedded. And, and uh, for example, uh, you know, you take something like like um, um, automotive grade Linux, right? And it's got to be changed to if if they want to use this to um, have that style of root file system to have it integrated in, right? Um, so uh, the interesting thing is when you get there, um, you end up with your binary delta of the immutable pieces, okay? And you have you can have multiple deployments of that, and then each one of those deployments has its own copy of Etsy. That's the persistent data, is the way that they manage that. So now we'll get a little bit deeper into that. So the way it works, you end up with that repository we talked about, right? Binary deltas, get like object store. That's going to be stored locally on your system in this OS tree repo. All right. And then you can have any number of deployments. And a deployment is a checkout of any object hash, right? It represents some state of some root file system at any time. And those are then stored in OS tree deploy, right? This is all locally on your, your target. And, um, and then you'll see a nice little hierarchy that's easy to find them, right? So it, they're organized by OS, so if you had, you know, this, this distro foo and another distro. And this, I think, applies more to the server side where this originally is being used. Um, then below that, you'd have a checksum for the actual, um, the actual hash right? from, from SHA-256. That's how that Git store uh, manages those objects. And as I mentioned, each deployment has its own copy of Etsy. So when you deploy, you've got all these different checksums. So it's multiple root files. It, it could be just one. It could be two to, to have one to fall back on. Or it could be n number of these. Um, each of those will have their own copy of Etsy that's persistent. Um, so you have to manage that in between right? if you're doing an upgrade. All right. Oh, and uh, um, the last major piece here, when, when you do do a deployment and you want to upgrade to that new root file system, it requires a reboot, OK? And we'll explain why that is. Last piece of, well, as we get to the bottom of this. So OK, so we talk about these multiple deployments. The way you, you deal with those is um, this OS tree admin tool um, so you've got a, a server 
feeding, and we said we had this local copy of the repository, right? And if you do an upgrade uh, and you have this continuous uh, uh, deployment feed, um, that'll get the next set of deltas and just upgrade to those. It's all built in um, to OS tree in their HTTP transport. Um, there's also a, you know, once you've upgraded, you can also do a specific deploy. So I want to deploy a specific ref spec, right? You just re refer to it by the SHA-256 hash and um, deploy that out. Um, once you have deployments, you end up, they have indexes. It looks a lot like your git stash IDs, right, that you refer to if you're used to git. And you can go on deploy any of those. So you can control which of those things in your deployment tree are actually checked out, right, deployed. Um, and then um, admin status, you can look at the, the status of all the deployed items. You can see all the indexes of them. All right, so how do we do an atomic update? We've talked about how we can deploy these things, but when we're deploying them, we're not actually, you know, changing to that root. We're not, we're not change rooting into that or anything. We're just deploying another copy of that root file system at a different point on the system. So um, you actually atomically swap the boot sim link, right, to a new directory. So um, you'll, you'll have under OS tree all of these boot directories Right, and um, this is in a, a case where that's how you actually update your boot, um, but whatever you do has to be atomic like that, and what's built in is that it'll, it'll move that sim link uh, atomically. Um, and then when you reboot, um, a bind mount is established, and, and it, 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 uh, you bind mount that uh, currently deployed, your, your, well, your preferred deployed uh, deployment. So you can choose from any of them, okay? And this can actually, you can combine this with a, a fallback um, type mechanism um, like the dual image does. So if you had two deployments, you had the latest one and you rebooted to boot into that and it failed and you use the U-boot boot count thing, right? And, and the watchdog resets, say it, it didn't manage to make it all the way to your application, right? Um, then it could reboot and bind mount the previous, the, the backup deployment, say you had two of them deployed. So very, very flexible and you can combine these, these same kind of concepts. Right. Um, so OS tree is kind of interesting in, in, in these is that it has a lot of identifiable downstream projects. Um, not all embedded stuff, but um, first place I ever saw it used was GNOME Continuous. Project Atomic might be familiar to people um, that, that's using that um, with uh, a layer called uh, RPM OS tree, where they use RPM feed to produce these binary delta uh, revisioned uh, objects. And uh, the Pulp platform is another uh, front end to producing feeds, because really the hardest thing is starting to produce those release feeds, right? Not so much the target end of it, but the management of those releases and binary deltas um, based on some upstream packaging, whether you're using OE or something like that. So GNOME Continuous uses Open Embedded, has it integrated in. Um, Project Atomic, like I said, is using an RPM uh, feed. Um, and then uh, automotive grade Linux is uh, implementing uh, OS tree support in, I think it's Leon here. Oh yeah, he's, he's got a little piece of that or some portion of it doing that. So uh, I know that's a, it's, a, it's a big job because the file system needs to change a bit. And uh, um, one of the interesting things they found in that is that um, uh, OS tree has this notion of um, it owns um, the entire process of downloading the update and deploying it and doing the atomic uh, uh, update all in one command. It's not designed to um, back end onto some other delivery mechanism right now. Um, so they've had to do some things. There's a separate, there's some separate commands I didn't show where you can actually manipulate um, static deltas directly. And so the initial cut in there is using that. So that's a more embedded project that's uh, starting to use that. Um, and um, 
I know the, the background of that one was that uh, the, the automotive industry is very inter interested in small incremental updates and for a lot of well-publicized reasons, um, addressing CVEs very fast so that people don't remotely exploit your vehicle. All right, so there's another major uh, incremental atomic upgrade mechanism. Um, it's the uh, SWPD, and everybody loves to have these generic names that are hard to say, but um, uh, it's originally part of the Clear Linux project, but it's actually an independent piece that can be used in, in other projects. Um, it's also a, a client server based uh, type system. Functionality is really, you know, very similar to OS tree. Um, same concepts, different names for the most part. Um, they, they have um, a notion of a, of a delivery stream, like we talk about with these, these delivery streams of bundles in their terminology, and it's the same binary file system delta approach, okay? Um, and then they also, like everybody, has a um, OE layer, uh, meta SWPD, um, so that you can create an image that uh, embeds uh, uh, all of, all of the, the client and a file system that conforms to their requirements. So you can find that there at the Yocto project site. Now it's uh, one of the key differences that make it worthwhile looking at is that they went to great pains uh, in the client um, to come up with a way to not require a reboot. Um, so there's some pretty intricate locking going on as the little dance is done to um, switch and change root uh, live on the system. And you can see this is coming from a, a server type, large uptime type environment where they want to be able to, to avoid a reboot. Um, it's, uh, it could introduce some risk, obviously, versus a, a clean reboot uh, after the update. Um, so that's worth looking at if, if you're going to do that. Um, and then they have, they have a tool, uh, you know, when you look at OS tree, a lot of the, 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 the feed creation tools are separate projects. They, on the server side with SWPD, um, they have some tooling as a part of the project that help create those bundles, right, which are those versioned set of binary deltas that reflect a, a release right, that you're doing. Um, and it also has the, the, the stream um, server uh, that delivers via HTTP there. Um, interesting thing here is when you look at the project, they don't see any contributors outside of Intel, like you do with OS Tree with a lot of different um, projects um, from different companies using it. Um, and right now, as far as I could find, um, both, well, obviously Clear Linux, but then Astro OS uh, also uses it. So I don't know that there's any other uptake outside of those Intel projects yet. Um, but like I say, it's very similar approach um, to what OS Tree is using. So if you understand one, you can pretty much go in and, and understand the other. Okay, and then again, I felt I needed to add just a little bit more about this. And um, to, to be mentioned with these container-based solutions, um, typically they're, most of those are not, um, they're not taking the approach of I need to ever update my base OS, my minimal base OS. So you need to keep in mind that all of these right now, their focus is, okay, all my applications are in the container. Um, Rosin IO can, um, can front end over a number of different base OSs. There's, there's Debian and Red, or Fedora and something else. And then they do Docker-based deltas, uh, Ubuntu snappies, uh, essentially the, the same way, but obviously with the Ubuntu base. Um, and then uh, Project Atomic that we already touched on, right? Um, it uses base OS. That one's actually managed with OS tree, right? And then um, they're doing Docker-based deltas um, for application things. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of possibilities to do uh, hybrid approaches here um, with um, keeping all your applications in containers and you know, leaving the, the limited base updates to a, another approach, whether it's a dual image or an incremental update. You don't necessarily have to have one or the other. Um, but uh, 
all of these projects, their, their focus, at least on a high-end application, is the, the application and middleware update approach. Uh, they don't look at the base OS as much. So, And I want to share with you that there are a lot of talks. <laughs> I wanted to put it all in one place. So if you're into software update, that's like all the talks here on various aspects of software update, plus the one you missed this morning at 10 if you weren't there. So uh, do check those out. There's um, deeper dives into some of these things. I tried to keep the opinion out of this and try to show the, the high level of all the different free ones I can find. <laughs> And uh, so I encourage you to check out these uh, sessions. I can put it back on that if you're looking at that. So, all right, I'm ready for questions if I have a couple minutes. Yes. That's correct, yep. So uh, what he said, he thinks the problem is that most of these approaches require read and write to the file system, right? And uh, that's true, right? So all of these are, are um, assumptions that you can run a client on Linux, right, and access some portion, either you're doing it in place, right, with those incremental update things and deploying out, at least in that, uh, file system, uh, another root file system. Also, you have the space to do it, right? Uh, so um, the same thing with the dual update, right? That you can go update that other partition, right? So absolutely. The which which? Uh, okay. Um, so uh, software update, uh, for example, we'll go back to that one, it's a pretty simple one. Um, he has a, a mechanism that when the handler, um, he has a, a, a handler um, for the actual standard payload, and um, that actually, uh, the software description has the SHA-256 checksum coming in the image, and each one of those images is then um, verified against that. He doesn't do any authentication, right? Just verification in that one. So not, uh, I don't believe any of these do, um, pretty much everybody is doing verification. There are other systems that are doing authentication style things, but um, if you look at, uh, I tried to stay away from the, um, more of the, the back end and the whole security thing, because if we just take that one piece, if we start talking authentication, now we got to talk about the whole chain of trust, right? Now we're talking about IMA because I can't have my binaries compromised either, right? So, um, but there are things like um, over in the automotive market, the, the um, things going on with RVI soda project and so forth that they're working out a chain for also authentication and so forth. So, yeah, most of these you'll just see a, a verification or to worry about the, the integrity of the payload, but not necessarily that whole um, chain of trust delivery. But yeah, that's an important, important requirement, right? <laughs> that goes out wide. Yes? Yeah, um, uh, good point. Um, so yeah, that's that's one thing I didn't uh, explicitly mention, right? Y you know, part of your requirements, and, and I said, you know, you've got a platform, and what you do is really going to depend on your hardware uh, as well, right? So um, you're going to have to, if you want um, true atomic and guaranteed power fail safe updates, right? You can't do a single image update right, and sit and pray that it's going to work and power won't go out, right? And that was something that, that the gentleman at, at 10 uh, mentioned as well, right? And a uh, common thing, you have to design your hardware to have that additional space, right? You've got to have that extra partition, right? If you want to have um, incremental update support, because that's your market requirement to roll out these uh, these micro updates very quickly and apply them quickly, 
then you're going to have to have enough space to check out n number of deployments, however, whatever your scheme is, right, in that type of thing. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, yeah, so, so what Pentelis is asking, which, which, which approach is less, um, uh, you can't say, right? Because it depends on the size of the file system, which things are persistent, right? It's, it's more of a hardware platform situation and how big your application is. You can, you can implement with, um, with OS tree or S SWPD uh, a situation where you only have two deployments but you know, thing is, you're 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 keeping a repository local, right? So you might have a little bit more overhead there, right? And it's also more complex. So there, you're weighing off some complexity risk there versus a very simple dual image approach. If if you can just do the A B approach. Correct. Correct. So that's. An excellent point. So what Bahan's saying is, uh, you know, if if you're relying just on an OS tree support, right? Or well, let, let's call. I don't, I don't show any favoritism there, but yeah, if you're doing the incremental atomic thing and you're relying on that, you haven't you haven't necessarily dealt with the fact that if if I have file system corruption and I can't root off of that, how do I recover from that? So now you need you need to cover that requirement as well separately if you're going to go use that to do kind of the um, the fast path updates, right? Yes? Right, so just, just to repeat that, if you're strapped for space, right, and you have this recovery thing, and, and it's funny, that's one we talked about a couple months ago, I think, in fact, but, but the point he's making is, is that you can combine that with having that init RD that can go and recover from, say, a tarball that's that factory image, that, and then you can go back and apply all your updates back again and recover, so there's a lot of ways to do this, right? Uh, uh, one here in the back. You, you are in Okay, um, let me make sure I understand. If you, you're asking if you have um, a number of different blobs, but. Yeah, so. Um, you would maintain ideally, right? And it depends on your hardware platform and how you're, you're but you can lay things out where um, those are all managed in that boot directory. So there, you're, you're talking about deploying to different hardware revisions, right? Okay. So, in in uh, is, is it a statement or a question? Okay. Any of those could manage a full set of device tree blobs without a problem. Yeah, there's nothing there's nothing specific there because typically you're going to store that whole set of DTBs in in like if you have the right kind of hierarchy in slash boot, right? And then have your bootloader uh, select the correct one, right? Based on platform ID. Yeah, at the end of the day, you need, you need some way to ID that platform to get the right one to have the single image. So that's another hardware thing, right? Well, the crazy stuff is always the most interesting, right? You know, the, the rest is boring, right? Yeah, so, yeah. O OS tree is most interesting to me right now because it, it's kind of pushing the limits, but it's, uh, it's a little bit scary too, right? Because if you've done a lot of the dual image stuff and you know 
you know that mechanism works and you need stuff to work, you know, in the telecom environment, that's, you, it's the same mechanism we've been using. It's not a Linux mechanism. <laughs> Generic approach. And it's simple. Yeah. Uh, um, they, there's been, I think there was mention of that on one of the, on, on the list on OS tree. And I think the intention, he asked if there's a hook into the deduplication dedu stuff in the block layer, uh, for these mechanisms. And, uh, he is trying to keep everything. I mean, one thing is it on the maintainer OS tree is trying to keep everything independent of any f particular file system, but that came up and it, it at least was an idea that wasn't rejected outright, so. I think, yeah, yeah, it might help that one. Yeah, exactly. So, cool, all right, thank you. We went over.